Well, hey folks, Research here again. A number of you have been asking me about this game here, so we're going to give this one a shot. Ultimate General Gettysburg. Lucky me, it was just on sale, so I snapped it up and tested it out a little bit. It's, a, it's an interesting game. It's very pretty. It's a very cinematic game. We have already covered what this History Channel Secret Missions of Civil War game is going to do for Gettysburg. That one very short sniping level was the entirety of the Gettysburg uh, component of the game, uh, though to be fair, that company did make another Civil War game called Nation Divided, and it has a, uh, a larger section for that in there. But Gettysburg was very important, and so since as long as we're looking at uh, at other fun games that cover Civil War stuff, may as well do a Gettysburg one since that was pretty important. Now, I suspect many of you listening to this right now are Americans, so you have an idea of the very large role Gettysburg played in both the Civil War and in American history. But if you don't have that background, then you might not be clear on why this was such a big deal. So we are going to do a deep dive on this one. Buckle up, guys. This one's going to be long. Uh, but if there's one thing I can talk about for a while, it's Gettysburg. So let's get going here. So before we jump into the battle particulars, let's back it up. We need to go back to the winter of 1862-1863. With Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville and uh, U.S. Grant's failure to take Vicksburg, the siege had been going on for a long time there, uh, Union morale had plunged to one of its lowest points for the entire war. Now, we're going to look at military events in the Eastern Theater uh, forward into the summer of 1863. Uh, we'll examine the strategic situation there in May and June. Uh, then we'll look at how the Confederate planning sessions were panning out, the ones that resulted in the invasion of Pennsylvania in mid-June. Uh, we'll look at the Gettysburg campaign, consider the impact of Gettysburg at the time, how people viewed it at the time, uh, as opposed to how we view it now, which is very different, and consider the question about whether Gettysburg should be seen as the great turning point of the Civil War. But first, let's look at May and June of 1863, a time that was very dangerous in the North. It was dangerous for the cause of the Union. Uh, those who were devoted to the Union and, uh, and also a period of major strategic debate in the Confederacy. The Lincoln government faced both military and political problems in this period of the war. So on the military side, the absence of victory is the clear problem. Chancellorsville being the most recent example of the failure of the major Union army, but beyond the military side, there were serious problems on the northern political front. The failure of the Union armies had encouraged the anti-war sentiment in the North. The Copperheads, the, uh, the part of the Democratic Party that argued for an end to the war, said that the war was going away no one had anticipated. We supported a war just for the Union said many of the Copperheads early on, but now you're turning it into a war for emancipation, and we will not support that. We need to end this war and negotiate with the Confederates. And Abraham Lincoln was very concerned about that kind of sentiment in the North, and that kind of sentiment was drawing strength. From the inability of the Union military forces to deliver the kinds of clear-cut victories on the, battle, uh, on the battlefield that the North needed. Uh, the Union draft, which went into effect in spring of 1863, made the situation worse because it seemed like it was a desperate move. Those who were against the war anyway could look and say, look there, we're not, not only are we winning the war, but our government is opposing uh, this tyrannical system whereby they can force us to go fight this war, even if we don't want to. And on the Copperhead side of the ledger, uh, and Lincoln, of course, was floundering in the East in the sense that he didn't have a commander at the head of the Army of the Potomac, who he really trusted. He didn't think that Joseph Hooker was going to deliver the kind of victories that the North would need in the long run, so it's a very cloudy and troubling picture for the North. In this stage on the Confederate side, it's a period of planning. The Confederate civilian and military leaders are trying to figure out what strategy to use against the Union troops in Virginia. And in the West, Hooker's army still lay opposite Lee's army of Northern Virginia along the Rappahannock River near Fredericksburg. Now, Braxton Bragg and William Rosecrans still faced each other in the Tennessee Theater, where they had always been. And, of course, Grant's operations continued against Vicksburg. We can talk about that later. There is a Vicksburg level in this game. 
In each of these theaters, the Union Army was larger than its Confederate opponent, as was almost always the case. Uh, there were other threats on the board as well for the Confederates. There would be a Union campaign against Port Hudson uh, on Nathaniel Banks as May moved along. And, uh, and the North was also planning a major naval action at Charleston. So the, con uh, the question for the Confederacy is, how do we use our resources to best advantage in this very difficult situation? Well, many of the Confederate leaders said that Virginia is not the most important place. We need to either take troops from Lee's army and reinforce Bragg, or take troops from Lee's army and reinforce John C. Pemberton, who was commanding at Vicksburg. But Lee said, no, that is not the way to look at this. He said, I can do more good in Virginia by invading the North than anything that soldiers in the West can do. Uh, our uh, commanders in the West, even if reinforced from my army. And this is what I think my campaign will do. It will let me pull the war out of Virginia. If I go North, the enemy will have to follow me. It will allow us to gather the logistical bounty from our farmers this summer and take the pressure off Virginia. I can gather supplies north of the Potomac River. Uh, this is much like he argued for during the Antietam campaign. Uh, he also believed that he could strengthen the peace Democrats in the North. Lee read the newspapers. He knew the Copperheads were a problem for Lincoln, and he thought the presence of his army would help. And at the bottom of the list, there was at least a slim hope that a really successful campaign north of the Potomac might actually rekindle chances that either England or France would decide to help the Confederacy. As a sop to those who argued uh, that he should send troops west, Lee said that if he were really successful, that maybe Grant and Rosecrans would have to weaken their armies to strengthen Union armies in the east. Now, Lee has been heavily criticized for this. He's been called a man who had Virginia blinders on. He didn't understand the big picture of the war. He was always just thinking of his own army. But in fact, I think he realized better than any of his critics that the East was more important psychologically. It was more important in terms of morale. Lee knew that his army by that point had become the most important national institution in the Confederacy. And anything he did would likely resonate more powerful, both in a positive sense with the Confederate and a negative sense with the North. Well, in the end, Jefferson Davis decided not to go against Lee's wishes. He went along with his best commander, and the result would be the second invasion of the North by Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. And let's look at the initial stage of that campaign. It initially went well. Lee's army, back up to 75,000 men. James Longstreet had rejoined the army after the Battle, or battle of Chancellorsville. And uh, the army is now divided into three pieces. It had been Longstreet and Stonewall Jackson before. Now it's Longstreet commanding the First Corps and a man named Richard Ewell commanding most of Jackson's old Second Corps. And A.P. Hill, not to be confused with D.H. Hill, there are two Hills uh, fighting in the Confederacy. Uh, A.P. Hill would command the new Third Corps. By early June, the army was ready to move, and just before it went north on June 9, uh, there was a huge cavalry battle near Culpeper, Virginia, where the army was staging for its invasion. Union cavalry under Alfred Pleasanton surprised Jeb Stuart and uh, his Confederate cavalry and fought in the Battle of Brandy Station, an enormous, sprawling affair. Uh, big cavalry action, the biggest ever in the Western Hemisphere. Part of the action took place with troopers fighting on foot, but part of it was an old-fashioned swinging sabers and firing revolvers at each other kind of fight, and it involved 10,000 men on each side. In the end, Jeb Stuart was able to hold on and drive the Federals back, but it was a very close call for his command, and it would have repercussions. Southern newspapers said Stuart had been surprised, and that was humiliating for Stuart. Stuart had always had his own way with the Federal Cavalry, and the Battle of Brandy Station seemed to be, at least, many to, uh, at least to many Confederates behind the lines, almost a defeat for Stuart and his cavalry. A few words about Stuart are in order here. He's a very important figure in the war in the Eastern Theater. He's a Virginian. He's a young man, 30 years old at this state of the war. He's a West Pointer. He fought in the Indian Wars in the 1850s. He's a very romantic figure uh, and a real contrast in some ways. He is, on the one hand, a man 
thoroughly caught up in the romance of the war. The women loved Jeb Stewart. They would put garlands on his horse. They, they threw petals, rose petals, in front of his horse when he went by. He's a very romantic figure. He liked to go to balls. He liked to stage balls. He had a banjo player who accompanied his staff. He would pick out music on the banjo and sing. He affected a gaudy uniform. He wore very high boots. He wore a plume in his hat. He had a scarlet-lined cape and a big gold sash. He, he, he cut a very dashing figure. Uh, he was very well-armed. He had a big Lamat revolver. Uh, that's the revolver that uh, shoots standard bullets and has a shotgun round hidden in it. Uh, he had a saber and God knows what else hooked onto his saddle somewhere. Uh, he made quite an impression. But with that on one side, on the other side, you have a very capable, hard-bitten cavalryman who is absolutely brilliant at the things cavalry was supposed to do during the Civil War, and that is screening your own army. Uh, so the enemy doesn't know what you're doing, going out, gathering intelligence about what the enemy is doing. Stuart did not have anyone on either side who exceeded his talents in those areas. He was probably the best cavalryman of the war in those classic cavalry functions. He'd made spectacular rides clear around George McClellan's army twice earlier in the war. He'd gotten lots of headlines for that, and now his pride had been stung by Brandy Station. And I think it had an effect, this experience of Brandy Station, almost immediately, in that Stuart determined he was going to ride around Joseph Hooker's army when he got the chance. He was going to get his pride back. And that his decision to do that meant that Lee was going to march into Pennsylvania without the benefit of Stuart's intelligence, because as Stuart started to ride around Hooker's army, Hooker's army started to march northward. And Stuart found himself on the far side of Hooker's army moving north, as Hooker moved north, and the bulk of Lee's army was to the west of Hooker, so he's going to leave Lee without good intelligence for about, about three weeks. But still, the campaign began well for the Confederates. They marched rapidly north. There was a battle called the Second Battle of Winchester in mid-June. Uh, and on the way, uh, Richard Ewell went to, uh, went to a tidy little victory there and captured several thousand Union prisoners. The Confederates made their way to the Potomac River, uh, across the river, and as the third week in June passed, Lee's army was spread out in a big fan uh, across much of southern Pennsylvania. Uh, part of it Chambersburg, another part of it... Uh, Ewell, all the way to the Susquehanna River, not far from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Now, as Lee was marching north, Hooker told Lincoln, now is a great time for me to go capture Richmond. And Lincoln reminded Hooker that he didn't really care about Richmond at this point. The biggest rebel army was marching towards Union territory. That was Hooker's target, not Richmond. And Lincoln made a mental note that Hooker did not seem anxious to engage Lee in battle again. There was a little quibbling back and forth about just what the best Union response to Lee's movement would be, and at one point there was a debate about what to do at Harper's Ferry. Hooker wanted to do one thing, others in the War Department wanted to do something else, and in a snit, Hooker submitted his resignation. No quarrel with Henry Halleck, and Lincoln, Lincoln accepted it. So... The Army of the Potomac has a change of command in the midst of these very important operations, June 27. Lincoln named George Gordon Meade, who was commanding the 5th Corps in the Army of the Potomac, to be the Army's chief. This is the fourth commander in just seven months for the Army of the Potomac. It had McClellan, and then Burnside, and then Hooker, and now Meade. Now, Meade learned of his appointment in the pre-dawn hours of June 28, 1863. Meade wasn't Lincoln's first choice, and he didn't really want the job, and who can blame him? Here he is, thrust into command in the midst of circumstances he doesn't fully understand, and with orders to take care of the threat to the Republic posed by Lee and his army, the premier rebel army, and he had to act immediately. Uh... Meade uh, was 47 years old, graduate of West Point, veteran of the Mexican War. Meade had a good enough record from the Mexican War. He was primarily an engineer, uh, and, uh, and he stayed in the Army. He, uh, 
He commanded different levels from the beginning of the war. He was a, a brigade commander. I'm sorry, the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, he was a brigade commander, and then a division commander, then a corps commander. And he had landed at each level with, uh, with skill, if not brilliance. He was tall and thin. He had very heavy bags under his eyes. He was balding. He wore glasses. He was very touchy, uh, given to outbursts of anger. His, his, uh, his temper would go off very quickly. He had a tendency to lash out in the heat of the moment, and that temper... Uh, that temper together with the glasses and the bags under his eyes caused some people to give him a very unusual nickname. They called him a damned old goggle-eyed snapping turtle. That's too long a nickname to really work. A good nickname has to be shorter. But that's what some soldiers called Meade. He was a Democrat, as were most of the top commanders in the Army of the Potomac, but he had the good sense to keep his political opinions private. He talked to his politics. Uh, he talked about politics with his wife, but he didn't parade the fact that he disagreed with the Republican administration about various things. As a soldier, he had several strengths. He was a master of logistics, which is important. He had a very well-developed ability to grasp how many troops were engaged on a battlefield, a good sense of the battlefield, of following the ebb and the flow. He had a great eye for ground since he was an engineer. He really did have an excellent grasp of topography. Not brilliant, but a thoroughly sound soldier who was likely to do at least a competent job as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Well... Now, as Lee marched north, he thought that the anti-war faction in the north would get, would uh, benefit from his presence in Pennsylvania. My presence will give them ammunition in their work against the Lincoln administration, but it didn't really work out that way. Uh, the north drew, cro drew closer, uh, for the most part, in the face of an invading enemy. They were defending home soil. And so... Uh, the only state that really didn't do well was Pennsylvania itself, which did not forge a really praiseworthy record with Lee and his army inside the borders of the Commonwealth. Pittsburgh said it would contribute more troops to Philadelphia uh, if uh, Philadelphia would, and in turn Philadelphia said it would if Harrisburg would. Uh, Harrisburg said that it would if Pittsburgh would. There, there just wasn't a rush to the colors in Pennsylvania, and there was a good deal of antipathy toward Pennsylvania on the part of the other northern states, which argued, we're doing our bit to save Pennsylvania, and the Pennsylvanians themselves aren't doing what they should. Lee felt Stewart's absence more and more as the campaign went on. Lee, in fact, thought Hooker was still back in Virginia at the time when the Army of the Potomac had been in motion for a long time. It wasn't until June 28 that Lee found out uh, that uh, the Army of the Potomac had crossed the Potomac River uh, and that George Meade was now in command, and he didn't learn it from Stuart, which is where he should have gotten that information. He learned it from Longstreet, who heard it from a man named Harrison, who was a paid spy for Longstreet. Once Lee found out that the Army of the Potomac was in pursuit. He ordered his army to come together. He didn't want to be spread out across all of Pennsylvania. He wanted to come back together so that he could face the Federals as a powerful body. Uh, and, uh, let's, and the place that he selected was an area between Gettysburg and the South Mountain Range, just a few miles to the west of Gettysburg. A number of roads lead in there, so Lee gave orders on the 28th for his army to reconcentrate, and the army began to march. The pieces of it toward that concentration, Lee didn't want to fight a battle until his army was back together. But now, let's move on to the meat and potatoes. Let's see how the battle was actually fought. So it did take place before all the army was back together. The armies made contact on June 30th, brief contact. Uh, the real battle started on July 1st, when one of Lee's divisions under Henry Heath, part of A.P. Hill's 3rd Corps, just sort of wandered over towards Gettysburg to see what was there and ran into some Federal cavalry under John Buford. Two brigades of cavalry under Buford. Now, if Jeb Stuart had been in there doing his job, this never would have happened because Stuart would have known the Federal cavalry was there. And it was that Confederate infantry blundered into the cavalry, and it began and turned into a clash between a much stronger Confederate infantry force and a Federal cavalry, uh, and it escalated very rapidly into a full-scale battle as both sides poured reinforcements in. So let's look at the particulars 
of that. So, anticipating that the Confederates would march on Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st, Buford had laid out his defenses on three ridges west of town. Hare Ridge, McPherson Ridge, and Seminary Ridge. These were appropriate terrain for a delaying action by his small cavalry division against superior Confederate infantry forces, meant to buy time awaiting the, the arrival of Union infantrymen who would occupy the strong defensive positions south of town at Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, and Culp's Hill. Now, Buford understood that if the Confederates could gain control of these heights, Meade's army would have great difficulty dislodging them. Now, Heth's division advanced with two brigades forward, commanded by Brigadier General James J. Archer and Joseph R. Davis. They proceeded easterly in columns along the Chambersburg Pike. Uh, three miles west of town, about 7.30 a.m. July 1st, the two brigades met light resistance from the vedettes of the Union cavalry and deployed into a line. Now, according to lore, the Union soldier to uh, fire the first shot of the battle was Lieutenant Marcellus Jones. In 1886, Jones returned to Gettysburg to mark the spot where he fired the first shot, and there's a big monument there now. Uh, eventually, Heth's men reached the dismounted troopers of Colonel William Gamble's Cavalry Brigade, who raised determined resistance and delaying tactics from behind fence posts and walls and various things, uh, with fire from their breech-loading carbines. Carbines! Uh, we've seen plenty of those in the game. Uh, they played a pretty decent role here. Still, by 10.20 a.m., the Confederates had pushed the Union cavalrymen east to McPherson Ridge when the vanguard of the First Corps uh, finally arrived. Now, north of the pike, Davis gained temporary success against Brigadier General Lysander Cutler's brigade, but was repulsed with heavy losses in action around an unfinished railroad bed cut into the ridge. South of the pike, Archer's brigade assaulted through Herbst. Uh, it was also called McPherson's uh, Woods. The, the maps don't quite agree here. The U.S. Iron Brigade, uh, under Brigadier General Solomon Meredith, and enjoyed initial success against Archer. Uh, they captured several hundred men, including Archer himself. General Reynolds was shot and killed early in the fighting while directing troop and artillery placements just to the east of the woods. Uh, Shelby Foote wrote that the Union cause lost a man considered uh, by many to be the, just, the best general in the Army. Uh, Major General Abner Doubleday assumed command. Uh, fighting in the Chambersburg Pike area lasted until about 12.30 p.m. It resumed around 2.30 p.m. when Heth's entire division engaged, uh, adding the brigades of Pettigrew and uh, Colonel John M. Brockenbro. Now, as Pettigrew's North Carolina Brigade came online, they flanked the 19th Indiana and drove the Iron Brigade back. The 26th North Carolina, which was the largest regiment in the Army, lost heavily leaving the first day's fight with around 200 men. So they went from over 800 men down to 200 men. By the end of the three-day battle, they had 150 men left. It was the highest casualty percentage for one battle of any regiment, north or south. Slowly, the Iron Brigade was pushed out of the woods towards Seminary Ridge. Uh, Hill added Major General William Dorsey Pender's division to the assault, and the First Corps was driven back through the woods of the Lutheran Seminary and the streets of Gettysburg. So they're into the town now. As the fighting to the west proceeded, two divisions of Ewell's Second Corps marching west towards Cash Town in accordance with Lee's, with Lee's order to, uh, to concentrate in that vicinity turned south on the Carlisle and Harrisburg roads towards Gettysburg. Uh, the Union 11th Corps, Major General Oliver O. Howard, raced north on the Baltimore Pike and the Taneytown Road. By early afternoon, the U.S. line ran a semicircle west, north, and northeast of Gettysburg. But the U.S. did not have enough troops. Cutler, whose brigade was deployed north of the Chambersburg Pike, had his right flank in the air. The leftmost division of the 11th Corps was unable to deploy in time to strengthen the line, so Doubleday was forced to throw in reserve brigades just to salvage his own men. Around 2 p.m., the Confederate 2nd Corps divisions of Major General Robert E. Rhodes and Jubal Early assaulted and outflanked the Union 1st and 11th Corps positions north and northwest of town. The Confederate brigades of Colonel Edward A. O'Neill and Brigadier General Alfred Iverson suffered severe losses, assaulting the 1st Corps division of Brigadier General John C. Robinson south of Oak Hill. Early's division profited from a blunder by uh, Brigadier General Francis C. Barlow when he advanced his 11th Corps to Blotcher's Knoll, and that's directly north of town. It's now called Barlow's Knoll, and this, was, this became a salient. 
In the core line, susceptible to attack from multiple sides, and Jubal Early's troops overran Barlow's division, which constituted the right flank of the Union Army's position. Barlow was, or Barlow was wounded and captured in the attack. As the U.S. positions collapsed both north and west of town, General Howard ordered a retreat to the high ground south of town at Cemetery Hill, where he had left the division of Brigadier General Adolf von Steinwehr in reserve. Major General, <laughs> Major General Winfield S. Hancock assumed command of the battlefield sent by Meade when he heard that Reynolds had been killed. Hancock uh, was the commander of the 2nd Corps and Meade's most trusted subordinate. He was ordered to take command of the field and to determine whether Gettysburg was an appropriate place for a major battle. Hancock told Howard, I think this is the strongest position by nature upon which to fight a battle that I ever saw. When Howard agreed, Hancock concluded with the discussion uh, and said, very well, sir, I select this as the battlefield. Hancock's determination had a morale-boosting effect on the retreating Union soldiers. Remember, they're badly outnumbered at this point. Uh, but he played no tactical role on that first day. General Lee understood the defensive potential to the Union. If they held this high ground, he sent orders to Ewell that Cemetery Hill be taken if practicable. Ewell, who had previously served under Stonewall Jackson, who was a, uh, a general well-known for issue uh, for issuing preemptory orders, determined that such an assault was not practicable and thus did not attempt it. Uh, and this decision is considered by many historians to be a great missed opportunity. The first day at Gettysburg, more significant than simply a prelude to the bloody second and third days, ranks as the 23rd biggest battle of the war by number of troops engaged. Only one quarter of Meade's army and one-third of Lee's army were engaged. And something I find very interesting here, if you look at the maps of Gettysburg, the uh, the Union is coming in from the south. The northerners are coming in from the south, while the southerners are coming in from the north. I've, I always found that interesting. So, day two. Throughout the evening of July 1st and the morning of July 2, uh, most of the remaining infantry of both armies arrived on the field, including the Union 2nd, 3rd, 5th, 6th, and 12th Corps. Two of Longstreet's brigades were on the road. Uh, Brigadier General George Pickett had begun the 22-mile uh, march from Chambersburg, and so he was coming in uh, at the back, uh, while Brigadier uh, General E.M. Law had begun the march from Guilford. Uh, both arrived late in the morning. Law completed his 28-mile march in 11 hours. My goodness. The Union line ran from Culp's Hill, southeast of town, northwest to Cemetery Hill, just south of town, and then south for nearly two miles along Cemetery Ridge, terminating just north of Little Round Top. Most of the 12th Corps was on Culp's Hill. The remnants of the 1st and 11th Corps defended Cemetery Hill. The 2nd Corps covered most of the northern half of Cemetery Ridge. And the 3rd Corps was ordered to take up a position to its flank. The shape of the Union line is popularly described as the fish hook. And you can really see that. Uh, you're not going to see that in the way I'm playing this, by the way. I, I am not able to emulate the historical stuff there but if you look at the uh, historical maps you can see it's a very very uh, recognizable fish hook or big capital j the confederate line paralleled the union line about a mile to the west on seminary ridge it ran east through town then curved southeast to a point opposite culps hill uh, so the union army had interior lines and the confederate line was nearly five miles long Lee's battle plan for July 2 called for a general assault of Meade's positions. On the right, Longstreet's 1st Corps was to position itself to attack the Union left flank, facing northeast. Uh, it was going to roll up the U.S. line. The attack sequence was to begin with Major Generals John Bell Hood and Lafayette McLaws divisions, followed by Major General Richard H. Anderson's divisions of the Hill 3rd Corps. On the left, Lee instructed Ewell to position his 2nd Corps to attack Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill when he heard the gunfire from Longstreet's assault, preventing Meade from shifting troops to bolster his left. Though it does not appear in either his or Lee's official report, Ewell claimed years later that Lee had changed the order to simultaneously attack, calling for only a diversion to be turned into a full-scale attack if a favorable opportunity presented itself. Lee's plan, however, 
was based on faulty intelligence. It was exacerbated by Stewart's continued absence from the battlefield. Though Lee personally reconnoitered his left during the morning, he did not visit Longstreet's position on the Confederate right. Even so, Lee rejected suggestions that Longstreet move beyond Meade's left and attack the Union flank, capturing the supply trains and effectively blocking Meade's escape route. Lee did not issue orders for the attack until 11 a.m. He had originally hoped to get this attack started much earlier in the day, but the delays involved in the, uh, in the various uh, brigadier generals arriving so late in the day slowed everything down. About noon, General Anderson's advancing troops were discovered by General Sickles' outpost guard and the Third Corps, upon which Longstreet's First Corps was to form. And they didn't get into position until 1 p.m. Hood and McLaws, after their long march, were not yet in position, and they didn't launch their attacks until 4 and 5 p.m. respectively. So, so much for an early morning attack. As Longstreet's left, defi uh, left division under Major General Laws, uh, McLaws advanced, they unexpectedly found Major General Sickles' Third Corps directly in their path. Sickles had been dissatisfied with the position assigned to him on the southern end of Cemetery Ridge. Seeing ground better suited for artillery positions a half a mile to the west, he advanced his corps without orders to the slightly higher ground along the Emmitsburg Road. The new line ran from Devil's Den uh, northwest to the Sherfy Farms Peach Orchard, and then northeast along the Emmitsburg Road to south of the Kadori Farm. This created an untenable salient at the Peach Orchard. Uh, Brigadier General Andrew A. Humphrey's division, uh, the, uh, they were subject to attacks from two sides and were spread out over an even longer front than their small corps could defend effectively. The Confederate artillery was ordered to open fire at 3 p.m. Meade was with Sickles at this time, urging Sickles to return to his assigned position. Meade was forced to send 20,000 reinforcements, the entire 5th Corps, Brigadier General John C. Caldwell's division of the 2nd Corps, most of the 12th Corps, and portions of the newly arrived 6th Corps, uh, uh, Hood's division moved more to the east than intended, uh, losing its assignment. Uh, I'm sorry, losing its alignment with the Emmitsburg Road, attacking Devil's Den and the Little Round Top. McLaws, coming in on Hood's left, drove multiple attacks into the thinly stretched Third Corps in the wheat field and overwhelmed them. McLaws' attack eventually reached Plum Run Valley, what uh, was later called the Valley of Death. Uh, before being beaten back by the Pennsylvania Reserve's division of the 5th Corps, moving down from Little Round Top. The 3rd Corps was virtually destroyed as a combat unit in this battle. Sickles' leg was amputated after it was shattered by a cannonball. Uh, Caldwell's division was destroyed piecemeal in the wheat field. Anderson's division, coming from McLaws' left and starting forward around 6 p.m., reached the crest of Cemetery Ridge, but it could not hold the position in the face of counterattacks from the 2nd Corps, including an almost suicidal bayonet charge by the 1st Minnesota Regiment against a uh, Confederate brigade ordered in desperation by Hancock to buy time for reinforcements to arrive. As fighting raged in the wheat field and the Devil's Den, Colonel Strong Vincent of the 5th Corps had a precarious hold on Little Round Top, an important hill at the extreme left of the Union line. His brigade of four relatively small regiments was able to resist repeated assaults by Brigadier General Evander M. Law's brigade of Hood's division. Meade's chief engineer had realized the importance of this position and dispatched Vincent's brigade, an artillery battery, and the 140th New York to occupy Little Round Top mere minutes before Hood's troops arrived. They were both racing to the top of this hill. The defense of the Little Round Top with a bayonet charge by the 20th Maine, uh, ordered by Joshua L. Chamberlain, but possibly not led by him. Uh, the jury's still out. People think maybe it was led by Lieutenant Holman S. Melcher, uh, is one of the most fabled episodes in the Civil War. I'm, I'm Joshua Chamberlain of the 20th Maine. You know, there's a whole song and the whole thing. Propelled uh, Colonel Chamberlain to prominence after the war. Now, Ewell interpreted his orders as calling only for a cannonade. His 32 guns, along with A.P. Hill's 55 guns, engaged in a two-hour artillery barrage at extreme range that had almost no effect. Finally, at about 6 o'clock, Ewell sent orders to each of his division commanders to attack the Union lines in his front. Now, Major General 
Edward Allegheny Johnson's division had not been pushed close to Culp's Hill in preparation for an assault, uh, though one had been contemplated all day. It now had a full mile to advance, and Rock Creek had to be crossed. This was this could only be done at a few places and involved much delay. Only three of Johnson's four brigades moved to the attack. Most of Hill's defenders, the Union uh, 12th Corps, had been sent to the left to, to defend against Longstreet's attacks, leaving only a brigade of New Yorkers under Brigadier General George S. Green behind strong, newly constructed defensive works. With reinforcements from the 1st and 11th Corps, Green's men held off the Confederate attackers, though giving up some of the lower earthworks on the lower part of Culp's Hill. Early was similarly unprepared, and when he ordered Harry T. Tay's uh, brigades to attack the Union 11th Corps, uh, positions on, uh, on East Cemetery Hill, once starting the fighting was absolutely fierce. Uh, Colonel Andrew L. Harris of the 2nd Brigade, 1st Division, came under a withering attack, losing half of his men. Avery was wounded, but the Confederates reached the crest of the hill and entered the Union breastworks, capturing one or two batteries. Uh, but seeing he was not supported on his right, Hayes withdrew. His right was to be supported by Robert Rhodes' division, but Rhodes, like Early and Johnson, had not been ordered up in preparation for the attack. He had to travel twice as far as Early, and by the time he came into contact at the Union skirmish line, Early's troops had already begun to withdraw. Uh, what was said of this uh, of this attack afterwards was early, was late. Jeb Stewart and his three cavalry brigades arrived in Gettysburg around noon but had no role in the second day's battle. Brigadier General Wade Hampton's brigade fought a minor engagement uh, with the, uh, and this is interesting, the newly promoted 23-year-old Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer's Michigan Cavalry down near Hunterstown to the northeast of Gettysburg. So Custer was there. All right, so day three. General Lee wished to renew the attack on Friday, July 3rd, using the same basic plan as the previous day. Longstreet would attack the U.S. left, while Ewell attacked Culp's Hill. However, before Longstreet was ready, the Union 12th Corps troops started a dawn artillery bombardment against the Confederates on Culp's Hill in an effort to regain a portion of their lost works. The Confederates attacked. The second fight for Culp's Hill ended around 11 a.m., uh, and uh, Harry Fans judged that after some seven hours of bitter combat, the Union line was intact and held more strongly than even before. Lee was forced to change his plans. Longstreet would command Pickett's Virginia Division of his own 1st Corps, plus six brigades from Hill's Corps, in an attack on the U.S. 2nd Corps position at the right center of the Union line on Cemetery Ridge. Prior to the attack, all the artillery the, Confederate, the Confederacy could bring to bear on the U.S. positions would bombard and weaken the enemy's line. Much has been made over the years of General Longstreet's objections to General Lee's plan. In his memoirs, Longstreet describes the discussion as follows. Lee rode over after sunrise and gave his orders. The plan was to assault the enemy's left center by column and be composed of McLaws and Hood's division reinforced by Pickett's brigades. I thought that it would not do, that the point had been fully tested the day before by more men when all were fresh and that the enemy was there looking for us. As we heard him during the night putting up his defenses, that the divisions of McLaws and Hood's were holding a mile long uh, along the right of my line against 20,000 men who would follow their withdrawal, strike the flank of the assaulting column, crush it, and get on our rear towards the Potomac River. That 30,000 men was the minimum of force necessary for the work, that even such a force would need close cooperation on other parts of the line, that the column as he proposed to organize it would have only 13,000 men, and that the column would have to march a mile under concentrated battery fire and a thousand yards under long-range musketry, that the conditions were different from those in the days of Napoleon when field batteries had a range of 600 yards and musketry about 60 yards. He said the distance was not more than 1,400 yards. George Meade's, uh, General uh, Meade's estimates was a mile or a mile and a half long. 
And then he uh, concluded that the divisions of McLaws and Hood could remain on the defensive line, that he would reinforce by divisions of the Third Corps and Pickett's brigades, and stated the point to which the march should be uh, the march should be directed. I asked the strength of the column. He stated 15,000. Opinion was then expressed that 15,000 men who could make successful assault over that field had never been arrayed for battle. But he was impatient of listening and tired of talking, and nothing was left but to proceed. And what followed was the largest artillery bombardment of the war. Around 1 p.m., from 150 to 170 Confederate guns began an artillery bombardment that was probably the largest of the war. In order to save valuable ammunition for the infantry attack that they knew would follow, the Army of the Potomac's artillery, under, Briga uh, under command of Brigadier General Henry Jackson Hunt, at first did not return the enemy's fire. After waiting 15 minutes, about 80 cannons... Uh, U.S. cannons added to the din. The Army of Northern Virginia was critically low on artillery ammunition, and the cannonade did not significantly affect the Union position. And then came Pickett's charge. Around 3 p.m., the cannon fire subsided, and 12,500 Southern soldiers stepped from the ridge line and advanced the three quarters of a mile. That's 1,200 meters to Cemetery Ridge in what's known in history as Pickett's Charge. As the Confederates approached, there was a fierce flanking artillery fire from the Union positions on Cemetery Hill and north of Little Round Top. The musket and canister fire from Hancock's 2nd Corps. In the Union center, the commander of artillery had held fire during the Confederate bombardment in order to, to save it for the infantry assault, which Meade had correctly predicted the day before leading Southern commanders to believe that the Northern cannon batteries had been knocked out. However, they opened fire on the Confederate infantry during their approach with devastating results. Nearly one half of the attackers did not return to their own lines. Although the U.S. line wavered and broke temporarily at a jog called the Angle in a low stone fence just north of a patch of vegetation called the Copse of Trees, reinforcements rushed into the breach and the Confederate attack was repulsed. The farthest advance of Brigadier General Louis A. Armstead's brigade of Major, Major General George Pickett's division at the Angle is referred to as the high water mark of the Confederacy. It uh, represents the closest the South ever came to its goal of achieving independence from the Union via military victory. Union and, con and Confederate soldiers locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat, attacking with their rifles, bayonets, rocks, even their bare hands. Armistead ordered his Confederates to turn two captured cannons against the Union troops, but discover there was no ammunition left as the last double canister shots had been used against the charging Confederates. Shortly after this, Armistead was wounded. It was all a mess. It was all a mess. Pickett's charge was a major, major assault against the center of the Union line. 13,000 people under George Pickett's division and two other divisions uh, commanded by uh, Ridgeway Trimble and John Pettigrew. They covered seven-tenths of a mile was you know, absolutely ridiculous and they would fail of course it was in this respect this gallant doomed assault about half the men in the assault shot down most of the field officers uh, many of the brigadier generals became cav uh, became casualties it was a complete failure this assault on july the 3rd 1863 lee immediately rode out among the survivors of this of this assault saying it was all my fault it's all my fault he took immediate responsibility on the scene and it was his fault it had been his decision. It hadn't worked. He patched together a defensive line. Poor Meade, I think, was, was in, a, in a state of at least partial shock because of the, the scale of this battle and the chaos of it and the fact that he had just repulsed this major Confederate attack. He didn't try to launch a counterattack. There might have been some opportunity then, but at any rate, he didn't. And that was the end of the fighting at Gettysburg. The casualties were simply enormous. At least 25,000 Confederate casualties. At least a third of Lee's army had been shot down. Meade's army had been a larger one. 
more than 85,000, and he lost more than 20,000, probably 23,000. The casualties were near or perhaps a bit more than, the, than that. Uh, 50,000 killed, uh, wounded, and missing for the, thir the three-day battle. It had been a hard battle on general officers. Lee took 52 generals into the campaign with him. 17 were killed, wounded, or missing. On the Union side, terrible losses among the commanders, even even the Corps commander, Winfield Scott Hancock of the 2nd Corps was wounded. Daniel Sickles of the 3rd Corps lost a leg in the fighting. Uh, it was a horrible, brutal battle at Gettysburg with absolutely enormous casualties. Uh, Lee retreated on the 4th of July. The 4th of July. Northerners read a lot into that, that they had a victory on the anniversary of the Declaration of the Independ uh, of, of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, uh, and Meade allowed him to get away. I think that there was really only a, a very small window for Meade to do much hurt to Lee, and I think that was probably right after the picket Pettigrew assault. Uh, once Lee disengaged from Meade's army and got down near the Potomac River, I think Union attacks would not have been a good thing. Uh, but it, it, at any rate, the Confederates got away from the battlefield and settled into a strong, strong position. And that was the end of the fighting in the campaign. How was it seen at the time? We see Gettysburg now as this enormous battle, perhaps the most important battle of the war, but at the time it was a much more mixed view. The South was, uh, I'm sorry, the North. The North was certainly happy about it. On the one hand, Lee had been driven out of Pennsylvania. It was clearly a victory for the North, but many people uh, believed that it, it should have been, it could have been a, big, a bigger victory. Meade should have followed up his success. On July 3rd, he should have inflicted greater damage on the Confederate Army, perhaps even destroyed the Confederate Army, believed many Northerners. I'm not saying this was possible, but this is how it was interpreted at the time. Lincoln was very much disappointed that Meade didn't do more damage to the Confederate Army. On the Confederate side, Gettysburg was not seen as an unequivocal disaster. It simply was not. It was seen as a battle where the Confederates won the first day's fighting clearly, attacked gallantly and almost succeeded on the second day, and then attacked and fought well again on the third day. They weren't driven from the field, argued Confederates behind the lines. They left of their own volition. They weren't pursued. So it wasn't a success, but it wasn't a disaster either. Gettysburg did not have any significant negative influence on Lee's reputation in the Confederacy. Some Confederates expressed disappointment. Some criticized Lee. Uh, Wade Hampton, a cavalry officer in Lee's army, uh, criticized Lee for launching assaults against that strong Union line on the 3rd, for example. But for the most part, Confederates did not see uh, Gettysburg as a great defeat that in any way tarnished Lee's reputation. Confederates writing months after Gettysburg still in their letters and diaries would describe Lee as unbeaten as a commander and as a man who would never be vanquished. So we need to be careful about interpreting Gettysburg's importance at the time and not see it as a great Union victory that cast gloom across the Confederacy and convinced many Confederates that they were about to lose the war. So was Gettysburg the great turning point of the conflict? It's often presented that way, at least in tandem with Vicksburg, as, as a sort of a fulcrum, that the war is tipping one way before Gettysburg and Vicksburg, and then after those Confederate feats, the, uh, defeats, the fulcrum tips the other way, and it points straight toward Appomattox, where the war ended. The Appomattox is inevitable after Gettysburg, uh, and that is a very common notion. Well, it did represent a setback. It stopped Lee's string of victories, so in that sense, it is a noteworthy campaign. I'm not arguing that it wasn't an important campaign. It was. It stopped Confederate momentum in the Eastern Theater that had been generated by Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. Lee's losses couldn't be easily replaced. Horrible losses. And it probably killed any chance that Europe might intervene in the war. It gave the Federals a badly needed victory. It boosted Northern morale, as we've seen. But Lee's army remained strong, and it remained a major force in the field for nearly two more years. Now we think Gettysburg probably should be seen as the turning point, because we know a number of things about it that people didn't know at the time. We know that it was the biggest battle of the war. There wasn't going to be a bigger one. Nobody knew that at the time. They knew it was a big battle, but they didn't know it was going to be the biggest battle. We now know it was the last time that Lee invaded the North. No one knew that at the time. We know that now. We know that Lincoln gave his eloquent benediction over the Union dead at Gettysburg, and that makes it seem 
more important to us. Again, that was in the future at the time. That, that wasn't part of the balance of how to assess it within the context of the summer of 1863. We also know beyond those things that it's the most visited Civil War site in the United States now, by far, which also seems to give it a special position as, as an especially important Civil War battle. All of the things we know about it now make Gettysburg drift up in our estimation as a great turning point. I'll just say that at the time, it did not loom as large as it does to us now. It was more of a gray matter of deciding how important it was than black and white. Union success, Confederate disaster, it simply wasn't that simple at the time. It did not mark the decisive turning point of the war, even in tandem with Vicksburg. It did not. The war would go on, and the Confederacy would still have chances to win that war. Well, I think I've gone on about this long enough. I think this is going to turn out to be one of our longest videos here. So thanks for coming along, everybody. I know we're not talking about video games very much here, but as long as a video game is based on a historical uh, event, we may as well give that historical event the attention it deserves. So if this is the sort of thing that you enjoy, let me know, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye now.